I grew up in a very abusive home. My dad almost killed my older brother. I saw him hit my mom, break her nose. I saw him take a two by four and hit my sister with it. So I saw a lot of uh, dysfunction, a lot of anger. But my mom kept her faith through it all. And I accepted Christ. I remember I was eight years old because it was the only hope that I had to hang on to because my father was not a loving man. And I remember my mom, she could sing in tongues. And she would sing in tongues to me all the time and I desired that gift. And I prayed for it for years, for years, for years. And she took me to this five-fold ministry. And I went up to receive the gift of tongues. And the person that was leading it, I thought it was a woman. Um, my mom says it was a man. But my mom went up with me and a couple other people that were there to pray. And they waited. And I remember them, the person that was in front of me touching my head and them sticking a mic in front of me and they prayed over me. And then I remembered a, a man touching me on my shoulder and they prayed for me and I received the gift of tongues. Well, I found out later that nobody could touch me, that there was no one touching my shoulder. It was God. Amen. And when I went back to my seat, I don't even remember this. My mom told me I was singing in tongues and the people that were on the aisles couldn't, they had to move, they, they parted like the sea. And I know that God is real because growing up in the way home that I grew up in and the way my father was, there were times that I wanted to take my life. I thought, there is God, well, just let me go. Let me, there's got to be something better than this. I can't live through this. This was terrible. And God did not allow that to happen and he used me in a mighty way and he is using me today and I know that's why I know he's real he touched me he touched my shoulder and he blessed me so if there's anybody out there that doesn't think that God is real he is if you don't understand just like the disciples and the people in Jesus's time they couldn't understand who he was but they couldn't keep him in a grave. He raves from the dead, and he's alive, and he lives within us. Healing in his hands, but could 
you for this time together, Lord, and we thank you, Father, for your spirit that's already moving in this place, Lord. We thank you, Father, for depositing within each and every one of us, Lord, the abilities that you have, Father, that you're going to use those things that you put inside of us to reach this world, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. How many of you in here would have reacted the way Charles did? in obedience to the Holy Spirit. Yes, you would have, Joshua, because you got a good example in your house. <laughs> yeah, I can see Joshua doing that. Well, the word today is called, get the mold out. Now, you know me. I'm going to come up with something really crazy, I'm sure, to, to preach, but it's what God speaks to me. He'll speak one word to me, and the next thing I know, it's a full-blown wow thing that, that just is amazing. But we're going to talk about mold today. Did you know mold and mildew are actually in Scripture? 
everyone's kind of halfway shaking their head. Did you know mold and mildew are in scripture? Now we're not just going to talk about the black and white of mold and what it is, but we are going to talk about the spiritual application of mold as well. So let's just start off in the natural. You know, 1 Corinthians 15, 46 said, first it's natural, then it's spiritual. If you really want to understand something, you understand it in the natural first, and then you can understand it in the spiritual. When the Bible talks about us as trees of righteousness, we want to know what a tree is. What does a tree look like? How does a tree function? It's rooted. It's grounded. You understand about a tree, you can understand more about yourself as a tree of righteousness. Amen? So we're going to look at mold in the natural. Now the first thing I'd like to share with you, some of you may remember, um, have remembered um, Gary and Melinda McElveen. Okay? They've been living in a home um, in Mount Pleasant. Actually, it's outside Mount Pleasant going towards McClellanville. And they've been, they were there, I don't know, maybe a year or so. And they both started showing symptoms that they had no idea what was going on in their bodies. As it turns out, there was black mold in their home. And they started, the doctor started treating their granddaughter who had been in the home and Gary and Melinda and the granddaughter and Gary got better, but Melinda did not. Melinda is currently under extreme IV fluids twice a week. She's having problems remembering things. This mold has gotten in her body and is growing in parts of her body. That's how horrible mold can be. And we think, oh, well, there's a little black mold in the you know, bathroom. Let's just take care of that. We don't think too much of it. But mold is a terrible thing and can damage a person's body. Keep Melinda in prayer because she's not out of the woods yet. She's got some um, memory loss and she also is dealing with her eyesight right now. She got a good report back from the doctors on some of the testing, so there is a chance she'll make a full recovery, but it is a long road unless God just heals her from this. So let's talk about mold in the natural. Mold is actually a fungus, just like a mushroom is a fungus. It has got its own classification. It's not considered a plant or an animal. It's actually in its own fungus or fungi classification. But they say that genetically, mold is more closely related to animals than it is plants. It has something in it called chitin. It's spelled C-H-I-T-I-N. And chitin is a substance that's primarily found inside of arthropod exoskeletons. Now, if I've totally lost you, think about a beetle and its shell. There's chitin in that shell that helps it to stay that protective shell. It, chitin actually is a, a builds the cell walls. So here you have a mold that is acting like a building of a, um, a strong cell wall, which is, makes it very difficult to penetrate at times. If you ever get a piece of black mold on the wall in your bathroom and you try to just wipe it off, it doesn't just come off easily. You have to spray it with bleach or you have to really get some cleaner in there to get it off, right? Am I right? Anybody in here ever had black mold on their wall? Come on now. Everyone's got a bathroom in here. All right. Chitin is, um, again, because it's so much of a part of, of animals, you know, it's, again, closely related. Mold is closely related to the animal kingdom. Some of the symptoms of mold exposure is blindness, brain damage, memory loss, bleeding in the lungs, cancer, and even death. Um, the doctors say that Melinda's case is the worst they've ever seen, and they're calling people in to look at her and said, you'll never see anyone else that has had it as bad as she has right now. So, again, keep her in prayer. One of the number one causes of mold, or the number one things that helps mold grow, is moisture. That's why you have, the, when the humidity levels are up, 
and you've got a pile of leaves and it's after a rain, you're going to see mold start growing within leaves. You're going to see it in your bathroom because when you steam up the windows and start marking on them, that's humidity in the air and that will cause mold to grow. All right, stay with me now. Essentially, the difference between whether mold grows in your home or not comes down to whether you have a moisture problem. Now, I'm going to read to you what I found on the internet. Um, this gentleman, his name is David Snell, and he has his own um, business up in Charlotte, North Carolina, that, and he goes into homes and he helps take this mold or mildew or any other issues that they have out of their home, and he put this on his website. And I thought this was really awesome. What a way to teach people the Bible from his very own business that he's running. So let me just read this to you. He says, the term mold is used interchangeably in the Bible as mold, mildew, and leprosy. Mold is compare, comparable to mildew. In Deuteronomy 28, verses 1 and 2 and 15, the folks of Israel were promised blessings for obedience to God's word. They were also told that if they fully obeyed the Lord their God and would carefully follow all of his commands, then the Lord promised to set them above all the nations on earth. However, if they did not obey the Lord and they did not carefully observe his commands, that curses would come upon them. So then it goes into Deuteronomy 28, verse 22, which is part of the curse for disobedience. The Lord promised to strike them with blight and mildew. So, listen, folks, if you have mildew and mold in your house, that does not mean you're under a curse from God. Can I get an amen in the house? All right, let's just get that straight right now. However, this is what the Old Testament, what they were showing the people of Israel, that if you've got mold in your house, this is what you need to do, all right? Solomon prayed in 1 Kings 8 unto God and says that when a famine or plague comes to the land, or mildew, blight, locusts, grasshoppers, etc., and if any of these diseases come, when a prayer of plea is made by any of your people, each one aware of the afflictions of his own heart and spreading out his hands towards the temple, then hear from heaven in your dwelling place. The same prayer of dedication is recorded in Second Chronicles and repeats the, the whole idea of having a curse of mildew. Solomon prays and asks God to forgive and deal with each man according to all he does, since God alone knows the hearts of men. Again, the people of Israel are found guilty of idolatry and abuse of righteous and exploitation of the poor, and God sent forth a judgment upon them, as is stated in Amos 4.9. Now, if the mold or the mildew, and, and this, is, this is a whole process of regulations that they went to in the, through in the Old Testament. Say you went into your home and you found mold. What you would have to do, if it was in a garment, in leather or wool, you would have to take that garment to the priest and show it to the priest. He would hold on to that garment for seven days. And if it did not spread, they would wash it. And then he would inspect it again. If it's not in it anymore, then that piece of clothing is deemed clean, and you can take it back to your house. But there's another problem. If it did not leave, that clothing would have to be put to fire. They would have to burn it. They could not keep it at all. Because you know what happens if you don't take care of it, it's going to spread, right? So these regulations were given to the children of Israel to maintain cleanliness and holiness. They don't have bottles of the bleach spray like we do, you know, like we do now to go around spraying what they needed to spray. So these guidelines provide a formula to maintain a holy lifestyle before God. Now, they also were given instructions as far as their home is concerned. It says, as they were given the land of Canaan as a possession, they were commanded to maintain homes free of mold and mildew. If an owner of a home saw mold or mildew in their home, they were commanded to tell the priests. 
Why? Why do you think they would have to tell the priest? The priests were the ones who said if it was considered clean or unclean, and they had to wait a period of time, again, seven days, for a reinspection after removing this, the walls. I'm not, they would have to go in and take plaster off, whatever it was. And if the priest found that the mold or mildew had spread into the walls, they would actually take the contaminated stones out of the walls, tear them down. The building would still be there, but the stones that were contaminated had to be taken out. And they would be thrown into an unclean place outside of the city. The remaining inside walls and stones were scraped and washed. And those scrapings from those walls were also thrown to an unclean place outside of the city. New stones and new plaster are then used to build the walls again. But if the mold comes back, that house is done. They take it down from the top to the bottom and get rid of it. Now, I told you all of that because first we learned natural and then we learn the spiritual application of it. Now, I'm in the restroom the other day and I'm standing there and I looked up in the corner and I'm thinking, what in the world is that in my bathroom? And then I started following the top line above the you know where the the trim is and it's all the way around not like caked on all but just in little spots I can see these little black dots and I'm like wait a minute that's not right and so I grab my handy dandy bottle of bleach and I start and start spraying around the edge of my ceiling well there was one spot that was really hard to get to, and of course I didn't want to be spraying bleach over the top of some other items I had, so I got up on the toilet, I'm climbing up there, and I take the Lysol wipe, and I'm, I go to try to rub it off, and it wouldn't come off. I start digging at it, trying to get it off, it would not come off. And so again, I got my handy-dandy bo bottle, and I did go ahead and spray it, and it started going away. Mold can be a very difficult thing to get rid of, okay? And again, what was the thing that causes it to spread? Moisture. Think about that. Now let's switch gears. What is water symbolic of in the Bible? The Holy Spirit. Let's look at Ephesians 5. If we can turn there. Ephesians 5, verse 25. Now we know that standing moisture is really the cause of mold growth if it's just staying in one place it's not drying up it's just staying in one place and if you've ever been in a damp unused building i'm sure spencer has been in a few with his with his line of work it smells and it's it's really a haven for mold ephesians 5 verse 25 we'll start there and we'll read to 27. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Verse 26. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word. That he might present it to himself as a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any such things, but that it should be holy and without blemish. And you can go back to verse 26 if you don't mind. Essentially, the difference between whether mold grows in a home or not is, again, do you have a moisture problem? In this scripture, we see that the bride of Christ, or in this case, in the natural, the husbands with their wives, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. If I have my Bible... And I'm reading through my Bible. I'm reading the Word. What's washing me? The Spirit of God. The Word is there, and it's doing its work. But the cleansing by the washing of water with the Word. This is like my sponge. Okay? With the Word. The water is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. So if you have a house, 
We are all considered temples of the Holy Spirit in here. If you have a house that has water that's staying in it and not flowing, what's going to happen? Mold starts growing. So when the Holy Spirit is flowing and he speaks something to you, and you don't do the U-turn, you've just opened yourself up to mold, a spiritual mold. And because mold has chitin in it, there's a hardening that takes place. And our hearts become hard, and we don't respond to the Holy Spirit like we should. Y'all hearing me? It is so important that when the Holy Spirit speaks to us that we respond because now you have a house that is flowing with the Spirit of God. And what happens with flowing water? Does it get stagnant? No. No. It cannot harbor fungus and junk in it because it's not sitting still waiting for those crazy mosquitoes to lay eggs. Think about it. All right, so we are open to the Holy Spirit. God did a work for us, right? So he could do a work in us, and then he does a work through us. The water from the Holy Spirit needs to flow. If it doesn't keep flowing, we end up hardened towards the Holy Spirit. And then we wonder, well, how come I can't hear his voice? Hmm. My sheep know my voice. You know, we have a pastor here who likes to walk around asking people questions. I have a question for you. All right, what you got? How do you hide a camel in the desert? Teach me. <laughs> you camouflage him. What just happened? The Holy Spirit's flowing. What does he do when he's out there ministering? Allowing the Holy Spirit to flow. Sheila. Yeah, don't be messing with me, right? I owe you $5 here. <laughs> What, it, what just happened there? It's flowing. I'm not harboring it all for myself. It's flowing. Are y'all hearing me? The word of God is exciting. And y'all thought you were coming in here for science class. I might be a homeschool teacher, but it's really, really helped me to understand the word so much more. Let's look at Hebrews 3, verse 7. If we're filled with a spiritual mold, our hearts become hard. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you will hear his voice, go on to the next verse, Do not harden your hearts. Whoa, stop right there. When we hear his voice, let's not harden our hearts. Let's allow him to... But let's see what happened. Do not harden your hearts as happened in the rebellion of Israel, in their provocation and embitterment of me, in the day of testing in the wilderness. Next one. How did they provoke him? Where your fathers tried my patience and tested my forbearance and found that I stood their test and they saw my works for 40 years. Wow. How many of y'all want to wait 40 years? We don't have that much time down here, folks. (laughs) God has a plan and a purpose for every single one of us in here. 
Every single one of us. It's amazing. I love, like Pastor Russ, I would love to hear the stories that every single one of you have of how the Lord has used you to minister to someone, to encourage someone. Linda was walking around hugging people, made me start crying standing in the back. You know, no matter what it is, we have God himself living inside of us. God himself decided he loved us enough. Well, those Christians are crazy. They walk around acting like they just got it holier than thou attitude, and they just, I'm not going into a church. I don't even believe in God. Why would so many people give everything they've got to serve God if he wasn't real? I know he's real, not just because I believe in faith, not to put faith down, but because I feel his presence on the inside of me. I know without a shadow of a doubt when his presence is with me. It's almost tangible. How can you deny a tangible God? I've heard his voice. I've heard his voice audibly. I've heard his voice in my spirit. I know that I know that I know that I know How real is he to you? I'm up here shaking. How real? Embrace your father. Because he wants to embrace you. God has his part. We have our part. This isn't something that I just tripped over and stepped into on accident. Christianity is not something we just, oh, I'm having a bad day. I think I'm going to go get saved. It doesn't have, oh, Christians in the, you know, Christians, we have our problems and that's why we need somebody to rely on. Really? Everybody has issues. I would rather go through my issues with the God of the universe than to go through it by myself. But see, people who are of the world think they can do it all by themselves. Well, there's some Christians that think that too. Been there, done that. They they think they can do it all by themselves. I don't need anybody to help me. All this hugging. I don't need nobody hugging me. Let me tell you something. God's love can penetrate the hardest heart. He can just reach right in and say, you, come here. But he will not go against your will. He will not force you. He will not drag you unwilling. We wonder why so many things happen in this world. It's a fallen world. Things are going to happen. But God does not change. He's the same what? that's right that's right amen do you know what the root word of mold means oh that's okay I'm going to tell you anyway actually no you're going to be very surprised at this it means paleness whether of a person like a person's face getting pale from fright and then it talks about or of plants from drought. The root word of mold. Think about this. Is it fear that paralyzes you when you go to share the gospel with someone? Is that spiritual mold of fear growing inside your body to the point you can't think, your memory's gone? You feel like cancer is inside. You can't function. Fear paralyzes faith. And the spiritual mold is fear. It is fear that grips us and not allows. If, if that big old grizzly man 
If, if Charles had been looking at him in the natural, I know Charles is bold anyway, but if that guy is that big and he knew he was putting himself in a situation and God had not spoke to him, I don't know about Charles, but if I was Charles, I would have been afraid because I've seen some pretty big grizzly guy, especially for my children that I had right here by me too, okay? Fear will paralyze you. When God speaks, how fast do we respond? Then, if we wait, oh, well, let me think about it. I don't know, was that God or not? And then the time's passed and we missed it. Mold is growing now, <laughs> okay? Fear, let's not let fear grab a hold of us. And I'm going to zip through these. Do not try to keep up with me. Psalms 27, verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Psalms 118, verse 6. The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? 2 Timothy 1.7. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity but, or fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Deuteronomy 31, 6. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you and never forsake you. Isaiah 41, 13. For I am the Lord your God who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, Do not fear, I will help you. Matthew 10, 28. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Romans 8, 15. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear. But you receive the spirit of sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. 1 Corinthians 16, 13, be on your guard, stand firm in the faith. Be men of courage, be strong. Now Joshua, after Moses died, Joshua was the one to carry them into, or the, or the Israelites, into the promised land. And in the first chapter of Joshua, Three times, it, just in the first nine verses, God says, Be strong, confident of good courage, for you shall cause these people to inherit the land which I swore to your forefathers. Only you be strong and very courageous. And then in verse 9, Have I not commanded you be strong, vigorous, and very courageous? Be not afraid. Now when he went into the promised land, in Deuteronomy 7, it's ta it talks about many different ites that they were going to overcome. The Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, all the ites that they were going to have to overcome. If you look up those root words of each of those ites that they had to overcome, every single one of them have a root word of a stronghold that we have to overcome. Pride, lust, fear, doubt, religious I, you name it, there's seven of them. When they went into the, prompt, the, the land to take that land for themselves, they had to overcome the ites. Just like you will have to overcome some of those ites in your life. And God will give you the strength to do it. This flesh, like I've said a million times, flesh is flesh. It doesn't matter whose bones it's on. It's going to act the same way on my bones as it's going to act on your bones. We have to overcome those ites in our life. And God told Joshua, don't be afraid. Get in there and do it. You can do this. Rah, rah, rah. No, I don't have any pom-poms up here, and I'm not going to do cheerleader things for you. But I want to say rah, rah, rah. Amen. You guys can do this. I know a lot of what you guys are going through. I know you can overcome this. I know you can because I know him. And I know he's in you. Now, we have to learn to be off script. I can stand up there and I can read my notes. Mm, mm. 
It's hard for me to stand up there and just read to you about the mold. I've got to be up here. Be off script. If you schedule your day so tight that if one thing happens, ah, the whole world falls apart, how is God going to turn you around to do something he asks you to do? We have to be so able and willing and listening. Lord, what is your will for me today? Whether it's in the grocery store or wherever it is, on your job, somebody you've met for the first time. Don't let that fear grab a hold of you. Even if it's, you know what? Jesus loves you. Hey, I love you too, but yeah, Jesus loves you. You know? Encouraging one another. Let's look at Matthew 10, verse 19. We, we can't be so structured that we can't just f- go with the flow of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Matthew 10, verse 19. But when they deliver you up, don't be anxious about how or what you are to speak. For you are to say... I'm sorry, for what you are to say will be given you in that very hour and moment. Now, that tells me that God is going to give me what to say and when to say it. I don't have to be afraid, well, oh, what am I going to say to them? I I don't know how to share the Lord. He is going to give us the words to say. Whether we're in this kind of a situation where we're taken up and and threatened or whatever, or whether it's in our everyday lives. He still says, do not be anxious for anything. Don't be anxious. Amen? Amen. So the question is, do you have a mold problem? And I open it up. Do we, as a body, have a mold problem? That's something only you and God can answer. But if we're not allowing the Holy Spirit to flow through us, then the answer is yes. I have a mole problem. If we're not constantly going out. Now, as Charles said, there's situations that God may put him in that he's not going to put you in. Aren't you glad? There's situations he'll put Pastor Bob in that he won't put us in. But that doesn't give us an excuse not to function when God speaks to us. Amen? Amen. Leviticus 14, verse 35. 14, I'm sorry, 14, He shall tear down the house, its stones and its timber, and all the plaster or mortar of the house, and shall carry them forth out of the city to an unclean place. Actually, go to 35. 14, 35. Then he who owns the house shall come and tell the priests, it seems to me that there's some sort of disease in my house. How do we get rid of of this spiritual mold called fear. You know, Miss Susan says, walk through it and trust God. You know, um, Joyce Myers says, do it afraid. Just do it. Whatever God tells you, just do it while you're afraid. Oh, well, I don't want to be afraid. Well, do it while you're afraid, and you're going to overcome that fear. If you feel like you have an overwhelming fear of really reaching out to people and really sharing what the Lord has done in your life, if you really hold yourself back and you need prayer, I mean, we've got leaders here. Take it to the priest of the house. Come forward. We'll pray for you. We'll come against that spirit of fear. Hey, Not to scare you off, but we might even challenge you. We might even give you some of these cards with these camels. 
and ask you to share a joke with someone and hand them a card. But don't be afraid. And if you are, do it afraid. Amen? Amen. A lot of fear is imaginary. No, this is not a snake handling church. You don't have to run. <laughs> don't put it past me, though, because one day I might be walking up in here with a snake and y'all be screaming and running. Yeah, I like going off script. The ladies, the ladies class, they're learning in, um, about the glory of the Lord in their Sunday school class and how the glory of the Lord can flow through you. And one of my favorite chapters in the whole Bible is Ezekiel 47, where it talks about the waters ankle deep, knee deep, waist deep, and the waters are flowing forth from the temple. Temples of God, the water flowing from the temples, the Holy Spirit reaching out, touching water that's dead and bringing life to that water. When you get a chance, read Ezekiel 47. God has a plan. It's a big plan. It's not to live and die and that's it. Like Pastor Bob shared this week, we have an eternity. We're not going to die. We live forever. We have an entire forever to deal with. It's not just here and now. It's forever and ever and ever. When we get consumed with what's just here and now, that's when fear comes in. That's when doubt comes in. But when our eyes are focused on the bigger picture, we're seeing the forest, not just the tree. Amen? Chin up, soldiers. Be encouraged. God loves you enough to choose you and to send you out to do his will. Amen. Amen.